from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. For Emily Chang, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, on the one-year anniversary of January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol, we'll speak with Representative Ro Khanna, Democrat of California, of course, what he has to say about the role of social media, what changes must be made. Plus, you can now get a rapid test delivered to your door in just minutes, apparently. I'll explain how. Coming up. And the future of farming. Deer announcing a fully autonomous tractor at CES. We'll talk to Deer CTO Jamie Hinman about how fast we can expect these to hit the market. And we'll get to all of that in just a moment. But first, of course, we have to check in on where the markets were. Big tech sell-off and the rebound, it didn't last for long. Kriti Gupta is here to explain why the dip buyers didn't come out in force. Yeah, Caroline, a third straight day of selling in the S&P 500. And you're right, it was a lot driven by tech. You did see a little bit of buying throughout the day, which is why some of the losses aren't as severe as they were yesterday. But still, a third day of losses, especially when it comes to those big tech names, nothing to sneeze at. And a lot of it has to do with what you're expecting in the bond market. The Federal Reserve, especially, a lot of those bets that they're going to hike faster and more times, as many is four rate hikes priced into the rest of this year. That's really what's spooking tech, a lot of which is driven by that hedge fund selling. One of the movers, though, I really want to uh, kind of captivate, or I should say uh, focus in on, is Rivian, of course. This is going to be the second day that Rivian shares are seeing a, a pretty big sell-off. It's actually ended the day down about 3%, but at one point it was down far, far more than that. A lot of the having to do with Amazon going to Stellantis to buy even more delivery vehicles. Now, the big question mark for Rivian is that uh, Amazon is actually allowed in their part partnership to buy from multiple vehicles. Rivian, however, is only able to sell to Amazon. That's going to be something that could potentially weigh on the stock in the long term. It's actually dipping below its IPO price. Let's go back to those big tech names, though, because that is really the story in terms of what has been driving the index through those record highs, but also what leads those corrections. Just on Monday, Apple hitting that $3 trillion market cap. And then you saw this really big pullback in uh, in big tech, in addition to the fact of that they are reacting to yields. And you can really see that in 2022, this is that kind of that less left or rightmost slump here. They haven't really started on the best foot. The question is, do you start to see, to your point, Caroline, those dip buyers come back in? I want to end with a micro story here that we are actually getting after hours. Uh, Dow Jones reporting that GameStop is entering the NFT and crypto markets. They are building their own online marketplace uh, that will launch later this year, hiring as many as 20 people to work on the new product. So you do see GameStop shares up 29% after hours, Caroline. Some meme stocks. Still got it, it would seem pretty. Thank you for keeping us across the news there. Now, of course, this is a day of reflection because it is one year ago to the day that hundreds of supporters of the former president stormed the US Capitol, resulting in the deaths of several people. They were there for a rally to try to stop the certification of the rightly elected next president of the United States, that being Joe Biden. The former president of the United States of America has created and spread a web of lies about the 2020 election. He built his lie over months. It wasn't based on any facts. He was just looking for an excuse, a pretext, to cover for the truth. He's not just a former president. He's a defeated former president. The events leading up to that day were largely organized online through social media, and yet, as we mark one year, some would say little has been done to effectively stop the spread of disinformation, conspiracy theories, violent threats that continue online today. Joining me now to discuss all of this from California Congressman Ro Khanna. He is, of course, a man that was inside the Capitol during the attacks that day. And it is wonderful to be with you and, and take us back, if you will, to this day a year ago and, and how you felt. Caroline, I was uh, sitting in my office in the Cannon Building, and then we heard that we needed to evacuate because there was uh, a bomb threat. And so I left uh, my office. I started walking towards the Capitol, and then my phone was flooded with text messages saying, don't go to the Capitol. It's being overrun. I didn't understand what people meant that it was being overrun, but I came back uh, to this office that I'm in now, the Cannon Office Building. We ignored, basically, the bomb threats. Uh, and I locked the doors and was here till midnight. And then the speaker called for us 
after at midnight to vote, and it was a real moment of pride that we could still vote uh, for President Biden and Kamala Harris to uh, affirm democracy. Congressman, of course, I'm sure from your perspective, you were torn because this is a moment where a lot, many laid blame at the feet of some companies which you are within your representative area, which were born in California. Many wanted more strides to be taken to suppress this sort of ability to incite violence through the spread of arrangements online. How do you mark, how do you grade the likes of Facebook, the likes of Twitter, the likes of the publicly traded larger social media platforms that some feel had some role to play in this day last year? I'm very proud of representing Silicon Valley, but I agree with the critics that these companies, particularly Facebook, uh, are to blame. I mean, I read reporting on the ugly truth by two journalists that Facebook basically was sitting on information that their private security had said uh, there are going to be assassination attempts. We're monitoring this online. And the decision was made uh, not to report that to law enforcement, not to provide any warning. That is wrong. Let me be very clear. The First Amendment does not protect the right to incite violence. It does not protect the right to plan assassinations. And these companies uh, need to do a much better job in, uh, in monitoring and removing threats of violence and, and alerting law enforcement about them. At, to that end, you know, m many would say that these companies have invested a significant amount in so doing. They're using algorithms, they're using people, but it is a game of whack-a-mole. There are just too many people, too much information out there to bring down. How do you feel about that? Sh could more strides be made? Of course, in this case, there was a conscious decision that Facebook made not to report the information. They knew where the information was. I mean, give me a break. If these companies can micro-target people uh, based on their preferences and have the sophisticated algorithms to do that, they certainly have the ability to remove threats of violence, incitement to violence, or uh, blatantly racist uh, uh, posts. And, and some of the things that they have up there, again, don't meet the Brandenburg First Amendment test. So. Uh, they can do better from a legal perspective, and they need to do better from a sense of what is in the uh, public discourse and creating a strong public discourse. The idea that you can just have people congregate and talk and somehow that that's going to create peace or, and mutual understanding is, is so naive. If it were that easy, we wouldn't need political philosophy or democratic theory. They have to really uh, take more classes in philosophy and ethics and journalism and really be more reflective about uh, their role as stakeholders in democracy. Let's let's talk about that that role because in many ways leaders of such businesses don't want to have to play that role. They don't feel it's part of a company's right or authority to do so. Is it going to take regulation? Is it going to take some other area of force? Because they could certainly be pushed into committing more capital to, to work. But what about the role in which they have in terms of taking down such information? Well, absolutely, it's going to take regulation, regulation to have more competition, regulation uh, to not have them manipulate data in the way they are, regulation to have basic consumer safety. But it's also going to take ethics. You know, the famous philosopher Jürgen Habermas said of newspapers that they have a commercial basis, but they're not fully commercialized. By that, he meant newspapers had uh, developed an ethic of uh, informing the citizenry and didn't just care about the bottom line. We need to see that kind of ethics develop in social media, that it's not simply about shareholder maximization, but a look at what is their obligation to creating a fair public sphere, yeah. uh, square. Um, to that end, I mean, how does the FBI balance this to a certain extent of, stop, or how does the government, how does anyone prevent these attacks from happening but allowing discourse to take place on such platforms? Well, the same way we do in a town hall. You know, I, I have town halls every month in my district, uh, and we have a wonderful discussion. And there are Republicans who stand up and say that I'm uh, d totally messing up and uh, criticize me and don't hold back. But you know what? We have police officers there to make sure no one is threatening violence. And we make sure that uh, you, you raise your hand when you speak and you don't shout over others. So we know how to do this as a country. This is not something new in terms of having a a public sphere where everyone is equal uh, and where you don't have the 
rampant sexism or racism. I just think we need to be more reflective on social media platforms. Many would say, indeed, the leaders of the largest social media platforms would say this is just being driven onto other areas, other areas of discourse, the likes other social media platforms that aren't as large and aren't as overlooked and overseen. Do you see that happening and how do we prevent just driving it underground but it's still occurring? Good, yes, they're right. But I'd rather it be driven in niche quarters rather than mainstream. I mean, the reality is if you're on NBC or ABC or the New York Times, that matters more than if you're in some niche space. And what has happened is a lot of these niche movements of hate and anger have become mainstream on these huge social media platforms. So if they say, yes, we can't eliminate hate, of course we can, mm. but there's a difference between having it be mainstream uh, and having it in, in, in dark niche corners. And I'd much rather it be in niche corners than mainstream uh, and, and amplified the way it currently is. Con Congressman, you're saying you're having town halls, you're having discourse among the voting public of, your, uh, of the area with which you represent. But tell us about what the business leader has been telling you. What was the temperature like at that moment in Silicon Valley as to how culpable they were or were not? There's an understanding of reflection of uh, their role. I, I think one of the most thoughtful, two people I'd say are very thoughtful, Reid Hoffman, uh, who founded LinkedIn, mm -hmm. really reflective about this. Tim Cook, uh, you know, I often quote, it's his commencement speech is worth reading at Stanford, where he says, uh, we can't be human if everything is known about us, and we have an obligation to really be responsible with data. So you have people, of course, on his well, well, he admires Gandhi and, and John Lewis. So you have people in the Valley who are very thoughtful, very reflective. Uh, but what we need to make sure is that there is a serious and broader conversation across technology platforms. They've done a lot of good. I, 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 I'm proud of representing the area, but they have a much bigger obligation uh, to 21st century democracy. And talk to us about your obligation now and your role, a representative's role, to make law. What is the legislative outlook for 2022, which you think could bring to bear some positive change for these social media platforms? Well, we have to do two things. First of all, by 2025, we're going to have 25 million digital jobs in this country. That's more than manufacturing and construction combined. We need to make sure rural America, black and brown communities have access to modern prosperity, that young people uh, across this country have the uh, ability to have opportunities in the jobs of the future. And second, we need to make sure we have an Internet Bill of Rights. I worked on this with Tim Berners-Lee that has sensible regulations on data so our data can't be used and then targeted for purposes we don't consent to, and that has basic consumer safety standards. I mean, the idea again with Facebook, that they are using a platform that is causing anxiety, depression, and suicide amongst teenagers. How are we allowing that? We would never allow that for any other product. That's not about, again, the First Amendment. That's about consumer safety products. So we need uh, regulation and the distribution of opportunity. Tim Berners-Lee, of course, of the World Wide Web. We really appreciate some of the time you spent with us talking us through your reflections on that day as you were there and, indeed, some of the lessons learned. Representative Ro Khanna, we thank you so much of Silicon Valley. Meanwhile, coming up, as the demand for COVID tests surge, we'll speak with the maker of one at-home test aiming to get kits to your door in just a matter of minutes. That's next. Mr. Bloomberg. Now, the World Health Organization says that Omicron variant appears less serious than previous COVID strains, but shouldn't be considered mild. The director general of the WHO told reporters at a briefing in Geneva that Omicron is hospitalizing and killing people. He also repeated calls for government and business leaders to make vaccine equity a priority. Meantime, of course, Abbott Laboratories' top executive said that the company is ramping up production of its COVID-19 tests after the convergence of a highly contagious variant with the holiday travel season led to an unprecedented surge in demand. CEO Robert Ford spoke with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow from the CES Expo in Las Vegas. Well, I think we've seen uh, a convergence here actually of, of two things. We've seen obviously a new variant, a pretty highly transmissible variant in combination with a period of the year where there's a lot of travel. Uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, people wanted to get together. Uh, so the combination of the, those two factors really had a pretty unprecedented demand here. But since the beginning of the pandemic, at, uh, Abbott's really been at uh, the forefront and leading the way here. We began manufacturing uh, Binax here in the U.S. with our three manufacturing sites back in September of 2020. 
We got to about 50 million tests. We saw cases go down in the beginning of uh, 2021. Uh, so we had to ramp down our, uh, our, our manufacturing. But as Delta resurged here in the U.S., we've quickly uh, re-engaged our manufacturing. We're back to 50 million. This month, we'll do 70 million. And I'm working with right. my team every day to see if we can get us to 100 million. And just to be sure, these tests can detect the Omicron variant. Well, listen, this is definitely something. So the answer is yes. We've been working closely uh, with not only our own scientists, but with scientists around the world. We have a, a network of scientists, and we keep on studying not only the Omicron uh, variant, but even new mutations that, that surge to make sure that the sensitivity that we have with our test uh, is still a sensitivity that uh, consumers can trust and rely upon. And right now, what we've seen with Omicron, with our own internal testing, uh, is that we have the same sensitivity that we had back when, with the Beta variant and even with the Delta variant. How much of a challenge are supply chains for the different parts of a COVID test right now? Are you sort of engaging with the White House directly over that? And what is the outlook for this year? Well, listen, we've engaged with not only uh, the White House, we engage with uh, governors and states and a variety of different stakeholders. Uh, you know, supply chain is tough. It's tough for a lot of companies uh, across all different sectors, right? Uh, but we've made sure to manufacture our tests here in the U.S. So we built three factories here in the U.S. just to do COVID tests so that we had a little bit more control of our supply chain. And yeah, we're working with the White House. We're working with different governors to make sure that every single test that we make, that it, it, it does not sit in our inventory and we get it out uh, to, to the people so they could use right. it. Let's bring this full circle then to CES and the consumer. You know, how do you read the consumer's use of testing and data going into 2022? Has it given you any ideas about healthcare big picture going forward? Yeah, I think that uh, the notion of you being able to do a diagnostic test and not necessarily have to go to a hospital or go to a lab, I think this is a new consumer behavior that will emerge from the pandemic. And, you know, Abbott believes that this is a, a behavior that will be here to stay. Uh, and so we're developing a whole new uh, diagnostic testing channel uh, with all of our partners to be able to create uh, an opportunity for people to be able to test uh, not only at hospitals or doctor's offices, but even at pharmacy and at their homes. So I think this is a, this is a trend that's going to stay. Great interview there by our own Ed Ludlow with Abbott CEO Robert Ford. Now, I want to continue this conversation on COVID testing and welcome Ron Gutman. He is the co-CEO of Intrivo. It's a health tech company that produces rapid, rapid COVID tests. And just talk to us, Ron, about the sheer scale of demand right now. Yes, Carolyn, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for the opportunity. The, the sheer scale of demand is unbelievable. I mean, uh, we're seeing uh, demand across the board. You know, we're serving all the way from federal governments to state governments uh, to large uh, corporations, all the way to small businesses and, and now direct to consumers. And demand is off the charts. I mean, as much as we are, you know, priding ourselves of being, uh, you know, health in uh, four dimension, 4D uh, data-driven digital diagnostics, uh, and we were able to predict really well and be available uh, to uh, consumers and enterprises alike throughout the pandemic, mm -hmm. we still feel uh, the demand really strongly. But today, we're announcing for the first time our availability to people directly in as little as 15 to 20 minutes, and that's revolutionary. And that is through a partnership with GoPuff, which can deliver them at speed. And, and how many? I mean, there is still a limited supply. Can one just put in an order for loads? Or, I mean, how are you monitoring this? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, like we want to make sure that everybody has tests, right? So, you know, uh, per, uh, per uh, order, we can, uh, people can order up to four, uh, you know, test kits, which are two tests in, in one kit. So, you know, enough for a family enough for them to get tested and they can, you know, they can place multiple orders as they need. But uh, we definitely uh, worked really hard to make sure that supply is enough. We are in more than a thousand cities across the United States 24 seven. You can actually get uh, these tests uh, to your home in as little as 15 to 20 minutes. And interestingly, talk to us about price point and the like, because I've just been in the UK for the holidays where you get these for free from the government. You walk into pharmacies, you go to libraries, you get them sent by the government, whereas in the US, the healthcare systems operates in a very different way. How do you manage to marry that need, that desperate need to remain safe at the same and earn a living at the same time as, you know, pricing it right so that it means the right thing for your business? 
Uh, at Intriever, we do both. You know, we, we make tests available. And as we said, it's available through GoPuff app and, and online and also through Amazon, Walmart, Walgreens, and directly on letsongo.com in a relatively affordable price. We're talking somewhere between $12 and $15 per test. And it comes in uh, two tests in a, in a box, right? So at $24. Uh, to $29, but we also do charity. I mean, we took the entire company and each and every one of our employees got a special allowance to actually choose, you know, a cause that they care about and we give free tests to these causes. So we do both of these things. We make sure that we have enough tests to work with government, federal, uh, state, and local governments, but also we need to make sure that we have availability to people that want to get their test to their home. And of course, it costs money to get there, right? So people who can afford it, get it through these channels. And people who can afford it less, get it through our partnership with government. Ron Gutman, really great to spend some time with you. You are an incredibly busy man, I'm certain. So we appreciate the time, co-CEO of Intrivo. We thank you. Coming up, betting big in New York State. Four companies get the go-ahead for Super Bowl bets. We'll bring you the details next. This is Bloomberg. Four sports betting companies to start accepting wages in time for the Super Bowl. That's, of course, FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars Sportsbook and Rush Street Interactive. And they're said to be able to have met the requirements to accept and process mobile sports betting in the state. It's all according to the New York State Gaming Commission. And SpaceX just launched another 49 Starlink satellites to low Earth orbit from the launch site at the John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, Starlink's constellation of network satellites will beam down high-speed internet services, especially in remote areas. Starlink has launched over 1,500 satellites and hopes to have over 4,000 in orbit by 2024. Now, coming up, as we look back one year on since the attack at the US Capitol, how has social media changed in that time? How hasn't it? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Americans increasingly are, are allowed to become effectively unhinged from reality in their views and in their views of, of the facts. in New York. This is Bloomberg Technology. We mark, of course, one year since the United States Capitol was attacked by supporters of the former president, many falsely believing he had won. The lies permeated about the election were allowed to spread online, much of it unchecked. Now, the former president was ultimately deplatformed from many popular social media sites after what happened that day. But was it too little? Was it too late? I'm joined now by David Kirkpatrick. He's the founder of Techonomy and author of the book The Facebook Effect. Also, we want to be welcoming Jennifer Greigel, an associate professor of communications at Syracuse New House School. Jennifer, I want to start with you. What's changed one year on? Uh, not much. <laughs> so, um, fortunately, we had the next president take office, and he also uh, is a fan of social media. We have to remember that, you know, what happened on January 6th could happen you know, any time now or in the future. And I'm just sad to see that more actions weren't taken to protect Americans against propaganda and that uh, that risk really wasn't reduced and it remains. So we really need to address that still. David, you similar view, any optimism that, that strides have in any way been made by the more popular social media platforms? We're talking Facebook and, and its various, Meta's various platforms and Twitter? I think small strides may have been made. In general, I agree with Jennifer, though. Um, not nearly enough has changed given the scope of harm that has flowed from the abuse of these services. 
So uh, one thing that has changed, I think, is the willingness of government to step forward and do some serious thought of regulation. And there's some interesting ideas about forcing transparency, for example, onto the algorithms and the nature of who's speaking uh, inside these services. Uh, but I don't think there's been any fundamental change of heart at Facebook in particular. Uh, one change we have to acknowledge is that Donald Trump has been deplatformed both by Facebook and Twitter. So that happened more or less immediately afterward. That is a significant change in itself, but it isn't systemic. And Jennifer, when teaching as, as an associate professor as well, what academically is being said that could be done? What cast the future for us? Because many would say, well, they could throw more money at the situation, certainly, get the algorithms up to speed, have employ more people on the ground to be able to monitor the disinformation on their platforms taken down. But from an academic perspective, does that work? Does it need to be regulation that works? Does it, or do, is this the human nature in a game of whack-a-mole? It's a little bit of all of that. I didn't start um, my career out you know, over six years ago now at Syracuse um, studying things like propaganda. I had to kind of learn it on the job out of necessity. Uh, that's one thing I do as a screening uh, in my social media classes now. Uh, go out to Google News and find a source. And don't just look at does it lean left or right. Who actually funds that source? And does it have a mass tag? Can you tell who published it? Um, it's basics like that that extend beyond media literacy uh, is what I've found that we need. And just educating, you know, students and the public more generally that when the president speaks, uh, that's essentially propaganda and it's gone unchecked. And so while we speak about regulation, we have to remember that there's a conflict with Congress, unfortunately, because that's how they get elected now. They go out and they set up their Facebook page and they use it and they acquire millions of followers sometimes. So. As you know, he was just saying too, like we can't just uh, worry about the public sphere and who can talk, but like who's being heard. And I'm just more concerned that we're not hearing enough news and journalism, and that elected officials can continue to go out there and and amplify their message unchecked, and that sometimes includes lies, unfortunately. David, to this point echo chambers. We've always kind of lived in them. You used to just go and meet in a bar or a pub and if I was in the UK and speak to like-minded individuals and talk about your own viewpoints but we've always been able perhaps to step outside and have different viewpoints how how can we break down the echo chambers that do build and thrive on social media because in large part that's how their business model works well these echo chambers are far more capacious than what we might have experienced in the pub. Unfortunately, they include far more people. I mean, one of the things that happens in this intrinsically divisive medium is that you hear so many people, uh, because of the algorithmic amplification and the way that you are shown content that you already agree with, you come to believe that everyone is thinking the same thing as you. And it really leads to a sort of fundamental delusion, in my opinion. Um, but what could we do? Uh, I mean, I do think, as the Congressman Khanna was saying earlier, and I think it's great that he represents these companies and yet he's so willing to speak out, um, they could spend a lot more money. They could actually have more ethical concern for the nature of content that's flowing across their services because ultimately they haven't shown they really care that much. They have constantly reacted. They only take actions when they are pressured or when there's scandal. I mean, and very concretely regarding January 6th, they tuned down, Facebook turned down their civic integrity efforts after the election because they said, oh, phew, it's over. And then the, tons of things happened that they just let happen because they weren't watching. And then as soon as January 6th started, they oh, my gosh, we better start watching again. And they started taking posts and people down. But they, they are fundamentally irresponsible in the way they manage their, manage their systems. And we're just hearing, of course, as you said, from the congressman that represents Silicon Valley. Let's just listen for a moment to the former U.S. Homeland Security Secretary as well. That's Jay Johnson. Social media at large, I think, is the issue that we, we need to, to, to tackle here. Uh, without curbing free speech, without undermining uh, our, our values in this country, I think it tracks back to the American people themselves to more responsibly scrutinize information and news that they consume on a, on a daily basis. 
Jennifer, exactly the point you are making. We need to take on board our own sort of learning pro processes, ensure that we're getting information mm -hmm. from the right source. But how yeah. does one let's do talk, that? Let's talk sources for a second, actually. The Homeland Security is a, a federal you know, government function. Uh, they have a really large social media presence too, helping people understand that this is an official source. This is not uh, a news uh, you know, outlet. Uh, and that until it is checked by the media by a journalist, um, you know, it's just information, right? So just injecting that more in the process. Every federal agency in the United States has a massive social media presence. We need to talk about that. And I still have yet to hear from any representatives uh, who have been elected who have suggested maybe reducing their own media footprint at mm. this point. And that's kind of what we need. And we, but yeah. also, Jennifer, rating media, you know, at, to ensure that what appears to be a news organization really is a balanced news organization or indeed yes. you know we've we've got news organizations that are inherently politicized in and of themselves everyone's trying to look like a news organization states brands banks senators the cdc They're and not. is there an answer to that the conflict is with the platforms. They're not journalism and they're distributors and they have perverse incentives as we saw with Facebook and Instagram, Adam Mazzari for one, turning up uh, evil essentially in the algorithm because it got more engagement. Uh, that's where we need more transparency to, to make sure that one company, especially you know, with an oversized footprint, isn't able to really kind of you know, turn us toward a darker uh, place in society. That's one of the main concerns is Facebook's size and Zuckerberg's uh, influence, unfortunately. And so therefore, David, is it a question of breaking up? Is it a question of regulation that brings us that transparency? I don't really think breakup would necessarily solve the problem. I actually really like the, the laws that are being discussed in Congress right now to enforce some kinds of transparency where, for example, when things are happening, it would be able to be determined by researchers and independent outsiders so that there would be more consensus, at least in public about what is actually happening on these services. Because one of the big problems, especially with Facebook, is they keep everything secret. They haven't really revealed a lot of what they know about the lead up to January 6th. They haven't revealed even things going back to the 2016 election of Donald Trump. They never revealed the targeting of the ads that the Russians placed. They revealed what the ads were, but they never said who those ads were targeted to. So they're, they're, these companies would prefer to have the freedom to do whatever they want and that is not that's not tolerable. We have to really impose regulation on them because society is not going to wise up enough to, to re remedy these harms. This, this government has to force these services to act differently. And maybe people like Zuckerberg have to learn to behave more responsibly, but I would not hold my breath on that. David Kirkpatrick, Jennifer Greigel, really great to get thoughts from you both. Appreciate it. Thank you. Meanwhile, in France, the nation's privacy watchdog has hit Google with a record fine of $170 million over the way it manages cookies. Facebook was fined $68 million for the same issue. Authorities told the companies to come up with a way for users to refuse cookies. That's as simple as the existing means of accepting them. Coming up. The future of agriculture starts now. John Deere announcing a fully autonomous tractor at CES, which they say will revolutionize the way farming is done. We'll get all the details directly from Deere itself after the break. This is Bloomberg. farming of the future, fully autonomous tractors. That's what John Deere, the leader in agriculture and construction machinery, is promising after an announcement at CES that sent its stock soaring. Deere's CTO, that's Jamie Heineman, joins us now for more on this live from Las Vegas. And Ed, you're going to take it away. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. You see the images there on your screen, a tractor in a field with no driver in the cockpit. Jamie, is this a truly autonomous vehicle or is this like a Roomba robot for farming where it's in a small geofence field, it goes back and forth, 
doing whatever it needs to do in the crops. No, Ed, it's great to be here. Fully autonomous, that's uh, the first time ever that we've been able to take the operator out of the cab of the machine. You know, in farming, as you well, well understand, we've had the, the connection between the operator, the, the human and the machine for forever. And this is really groundbreaking in the sense that we finally get to break that connection and the machine goes out and does this work on its own. There was some surprise, particularly from investors, about this announcement, the speed you've been able to do this. Is this a market-ready product? I mean, how many fully autonomous tractors will be in fields this year, next year? What volumes can you produce at? Yeah, we're still playing around with volumes. We're going to be slow in introduction. We want to make sure that we get this right. We're thinking, you know, 10 to 50. We will be in market this year, though, with those products, with growers in their fields doing work uh, for them in their operations. So I talk to a lot of folks in the trucking industry, for example, and we talk about autonomy, especially in the COVID era where drivers have dropped out sick as a really good tool. Where does this fit in in agriculture? Is this something that creates jobs or does it take jobs away? That's a great question. So the, the issue, the issue in agriculture is labor availability. You know, we've had this movement of population from rural environments to urban environments. Uh, the world population growing from 8 billion to 10 billion people by 2050. Food production going up by 50% as a consequence of that. All of those things really drive this intensity around producing more food with less. And less labor is one of those things that we need to accommodate. And we really see autonomy as the solution to that. Farming in any market, whether it's the United States, the UK, Europe, for those farmers, the margins are very small, right? The capital investment for this machinery is very high. Are people going to be able to actually aff able to afford to implement this technology? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, w the way we think about it, certainly it reduces the amount of labor that's required. Uh, but the, the other significant portion is agriculture is very time sensitive, right? And it's important that the job that's being done gets done at the right time of the year. And if you don't have the labor to do it, you often pay a significant penalty in terms of the, the amount of crop that you can produce. And so I think the payback for growers uh, is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, in many cases, it's a difference between getting the job done at all and not getting done. One funny quirk of this is that a farmer can control the vehicle with their smartphone. So just talk me through how that would work. Why would a farmer need to be able to have control via an app? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is this is all about the farmer's business, right? So they want to be able to interact with the machine. They want to see what it's doing. They want to make sure that it's doing the, the job that, that it's expected to do at the quality uh, that they expect it to be done at. And so they want to interact with the machine in, in the way that they would have interacted, perhaps in the in the in the cockpit, as you, as you mentioned. But since they're not there, we try to emulate that experience for them on a mobile device. All right. Give me the inside scoop. Who are you talking to on the commercial side? Which fleet operators, which kind of scale volume deals are you doing? Yeah, you know, I think that's the great thing about the solution is that it really scales, you know, from from small family farms all the way up through larger farms. That labor issue that we really that we talked about earlier is really persistent no matter what the size and scale of the farm is, whether that's one tractor or 10 tractors. All right, we just got 30 seconds here, but what does farming look like in five years from now? How many or what proportion of tractors are autonomous? You know, I think it's uh, significant. I think the adoption for this technology is going to be quick. We have conditioned, right. uh, you know, operators of machines over the last 10, 20 years with higher levels of automation. And autonomy is just that final step. We've got customers who are actually asking us, why do I have to be in the cockpit at all? This is the solution. I think they'll adopt right. it readily. All right, a dream come true. Tractors, farming, autonomy. Caroline, I'll throw it back to you in New York. Ed. Great interview, as always. And just after the break, well, we're going to be talking to you a little bit more about an EV car you know well. In fact, you tested it yourself, right? The three-wheeled solo car manufactured by Canadian uh. EV company Electra Mechanica. Was it good at CES? <laughs> look at you. Look at you go. Happy memories. You look like James Bond. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. I want to check in on a key stock today. Over the last couple of days, in fact, down almost 14%. Rivian, the electric pickup maker, 
backed by Amazon, of course, briefly tumbling below its $78 listing price. The move extended Wednesday's drop after the e-commerce giant announced that it would buy electric delivery vans from rival Stellantis as well. Rivian and Amazon say, look, their partnership, it's unchanged. And we know EVs, of course, are a big theme over at CES this year. But here's a twist you might not have thought of. Tiny EVs. Canadian company Electromechanica is showcasing some of its three-wheeled EVs in Las Vegas right now. But can it make it, can it compete with the likes of Tesla and Rivian in this increasingly crowded market? Well, the man is going to tell us all. CEO Kevin Pavlov's with us. And talk to us about the desire, the need, the want for smaller electric vehicles right now. Absolutely. Thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, um, the idea of this vehicle is it's a purpose-built vehicle for, for an individual. It's everything you would do individually. And what makes it really special is the idea that it's not an EV, that, that we're, a lot of those are coming out because the market loves them, but it's a really efficient and fun-to-drive EV. It's centered around one person. It's a quarter of the cabin space of a, of a four-passenger vehicle. It heats fast. It cools fast. It's a quarter of the battery size, so it charges fast. And you get all the same range and mileage. It's just a, a really well-built vehicle for the purpose of urban mobility challenges. And actually, we're finding uh, quite a bit of uh, great solutions for uh, last mile delivery, small parcel, things like that. Why not a motorbike? Um, well, this is a fully enclosed cabin. Um, we made a niche right between uh, micro mobility, which are motorbikes and scooters, and, and cars. Uh, and part of this, it's classified as a, as a motorcycle. It does classify there, but you have power windows, power brakes, mm. uh, you get in, heating, cooling, air conditioning, heated seat, uh, backup cameras. Uh, so it's everything you could expect from a, from a vehicle, highway speeds, uh, 80 miles an hour, you, uh, 100 miles of range. It just gives you a, a lot more flexibility in all kinds of weather uh, that you might not get out of a two-wheel vehicle. And then it yeah. gives you all the efficiencies uh, uh, that you would get out of a four-wheel. So how many have been delivered to date? Uh, so we've got over uh, 60 vehicles uh, that we've delivered to consumers and uh, fleets. Wow. Uh, we're continuing to ramp up production. Yeah, we started in October 4th, where we, uh, we had our inaugural uh, last year, and we just keep uh, ramping up. And talk to us about the manufacturing goals, therefore. Uh, absolutely. So we, we currently produce uh, out of China with uh, our partners, and industrial. And what we've done is uh, there's about 20,000 units of capacity. But as you know, the, the market is tough with supply chain issues, mm -hmm. chip shortages, logistics. So we've uh, actually put a plant in in the U.S. to service the U.S. So uh, now we've uh, increased our capacity, doubled it uh, and, and more. We have room for more expansion. But the whole idea is to, to really give uh, start out on the West Coast, uh, California and five states, go north and go east so that we can uh, make sure we proliferate uh, and, and give people what they're really looking for, right tool for the right job. So making in China, Canadian company, but your focus point is, is America thus far, West Coast, then East Coast? Who else is buy has it, all those 60 deliveries been to American buyers? Yeah, all, U all U.S. at this point. Um, our, our focus is to expand into Asia once we get our capacity in the U.S. rolling with our, uh, and by the way, our U.S. capacity is for a domestic product. So U.S. sourced, U.S. delivered, serve the U.S. market, and then our Asian manufacturing will then convert to Asian deliveries. So we'll have the, the Asian markets also. And can you give us an idea of who the purchases are? You said there's been interest, certainly, in the delivery space. Is that who's buying? Is it individuals who just want an easier way to work? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a real mix. We've seen a 50-50, 60-40 kind of split where retail sales for people who really want to solve these urban mobility challenges, parking challenges. So half of them uh, have been gone to these uh, very patient uh, customers. We had uh, back orders and, and we were filling the orders as fast as we can, but we really got a heavy interest out of, out of uh, retail. So, or, or, uh, uh, sorry, out, out of the um, commercial folks. Mm. And uh, now we've sold to a series of, of initial buys, initial sells uh, for these commercial users. And we're starting to see a lot of delivery, a lot of uh, restaurants, things like that, that are wanting to deliver themselves. And this is an ideal solution because usually there's only one driver to, to yeah. do deliveries and small, convenient, very economical. So it, uh, it fits nicely into, into the next step. Seems to be an evolution going on in the, in the food delivery and small parcel delivery market right now. Kevin Pavlov, really squaring that circle of all the demand there for electric vehicles. People want huge trucks. People want 
Tiny Three Wheelers 2, Electromechanica CEO. We thank you for your time. Stay well over there in Las Vegas. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Do make sure you tune in tomorrow as we're going to be joined by Jennifer Co Carolan, co-founder and managing partner at Reach Capital. Mark Mahaney, of course, Evercore ISI. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. This is Bloomberg. Thank <laughs> you.